Imagine you find yourself in a room you've never been to and the lights are switched off. What will you do? Well, most likely you would do something like this to, you know, find a wall. And then if you find a wall, you would s make smaller movements to see if there's a light switch. And then if you find that, you make even smaller movements to see whether, you know, it is actually a light switch and how it works. And then you turn on the light. So, why do I tell you something that you probably know already? I mean, we all do this. By nature. I want you to realize that perception is a very active process. If we navigate our way through the world, or if you want to see something, we don't just sit around and wait for light to hit our eyes, or for sounds to hit our ears, or for objects to hit our fingers. No, we move our body. We are in interaction with our environment. We move our body so that we can optimally see or that we can hear as good as we can, you know, by extending your ears. So, perception is a very, very active process. In our brain, we are very, very good at it. So, who of you thinks their brain is a computer? I see one. Two, three, okay, not many. So who of you thinks their brain is better than a computer? Okay, yeah, I agree, I agree. Okay, so recently there's been a lot of media coverage about you know, how good computers are, right? So there are chess computers now that can beat the best chess players in the world. And there are computers that can beat the best Go players in the world. And even Stephen Hawking, you know, Stephen Hawking, very smart guy, said, oh, you have to be careful with artificial intelligence. So computers must be now incredibly smart, right? Well, I recently bought one of these little friends. I don't know if you know them. It's one of those speaking home computers that, you know, are supposed to do stuff for you. I spend most of my time actually shouting and swearing at it because... Um, <clears throat> It adds elementium foil to my shopping list. I don't know if you've ever tried to buy elementium foil, but it's very expensive and kind of hard to get. Um, when I ask it to switch on the lights in my living room, it, um, I don't know, starts reading a Wikipedia page to me and it doesn't stop, whatever. I just stop, no. Um, <clears throat> so, I don't know about smart computers. And only recently have computers been able to recognize cats in images. I mean, it's not so difficult, right? And computers need trillions of examples before they can recognize a cat in an image. Is that really how we learn? I mean, if I need to learn how to cross a street, do I need to cross it thousands of times and be hit by cars before I can cross a street? <laughs> Evolution wouldn't really like that, right? So, <clears throat> we are actually much better at computers than computers at many things, amongst which learning, but also, Energy efficiency. I mean, our brain uses about 20% of our body energy use. So if during a normal day I would use, say, five peanut butter sandwiches, then my brain uses about one peanut butter sandwich. Okay. Well, an average desktop computer is about 100 million times less energy efficient. So that's a one with eight zeros. So if my brain were a desktop computer, I would need 100 million peanut butter sandwiches to function normally. That is about 90 trucks full of peanut butter sandwiches. Okay, but you know, our brain is not a computer, it's a supercomputer, and supercomputers are super, super good, right? Well, supercomputers are about 100 times more energy efficient. So that is still a truck full of peanut butter sandwiches a day, 100, uh, about a million. So, you know, I cannot drive a truck. So, if I would need to drive around a truck full of peanut butter sandwiches, then that truck would need a driver, and that driver would have a brain, and that would then need a truck full of peanut butter. It gets problematic, right? Okay, so our brain is very energy efficient. Our brain is also very flexible. So, okay, yes, I have this little friend here that can, uh, you know, 
tell me what the weather is like and, and keep track of my shopping list. But if I ask it, uh, could you fry an egg for me? It would not really be able to do it. Or if I ask one of these chess computers, say, okay, we've done enough chess now, let's go outside and play a game of soccer, they're not that good at it. So our brain is much better than any computer in learning, in energy efficiency, and in flexibility. Bra computers can do very specific tasks very well, in a very well-set environment, but we can do we can fry eggs and sing songs and play chess and cross streets and find light switches, all with the same brain, and even some of these at the same time. So, how does our brain do this? From this, if we learn this, we can improve our computers, right? So, let's look. Let's look at our brain. Our brain consists, like many parts of our body, it consists of cells and we call these cells neurons. And the brain has about 100 billion neurons. That's a one with 11 zeros. That's about the same number of neurons as there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy, just to give you an idea. And each of these neurons is connected to about tens of thousands other neurons. So there are a trillion, sorry, a quadrillion connections in our brain. That's a one with 15 zeros. So, okay, our brain is a very, very complex organ. How does it work? Let's zoom in on one of these neurons. If you look at one of these neurons, over their skin, we call it their membrane, they have something very special. They have a little electrical potential, just like a battery. And this electrical potential sits happily at around minus 65 millivolts most of the time. But every now and then, it shows a large deviation. It goes up to about plus 20, and it goes back down again. We call these action potentials, or spikes. And these action potentials, or spikes, are very important because these are the ways in which neurons communicate. Only when they send one of these action potentials, they can communicate with each other. They make a little chemical substance, a neurotransmitter. We heard about them already. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter. They can only communicate with one another once they make an action potential. When they make an action potential, they, make, they send out this little chemical substance that other neurons can then sense. So, in essence, the communication in our brain is an all-or-none kind of communication. It's a signal that is either a yes or a no. It's no most of the time, every now and then it's a yes. So, okay. How do, does the communication then work? How do we measure in our brain where the information goes? How the brain does these calculations? For this, we need to measure information. So how do you measure something like information? For this, we have to go back to the 40s, to Claude Shannon. Claude Shannon was termed by Ian Magazine the most famous scientist, the most important scientist you've probably never heard of. In the 40s, he was working in the Bell Labs. And in the Bell Labs, they made the telephone. That was why it was called Bell, or after Bell. And they were working also at cryptography. So we're, they were trying in the 40s to send secret messages that the Germans couldn't understand. So they were all concerned with sending messages. And Claude Shannon had two very, very good ideas that made it possible to measure information. The first was to couple the amount of information from the content of the message. So he said a love letter or a text letter doesn't matter. We have to measure how much information is in there. It doesn't matter what it, what it is that is in there. So how do we then measure that? Well, he said information is actually a, le a lack of uncertainty. The more certain we are about something, the more information we have. And the less certain we are about something, the less information we have. So he said the basis of information is a coin toss. You know, if you flip a coin, it can have heads or tails, 50-50 chance. That is one bit of certainty. The bits and bytes that are in, co in your computer. So again, information is digital. Claude Shannon measured information as digital. Zeros and ones, yes and no's. Just like the communication in your brain. 
So how can we now use this to understand our brain? We have finally, in neuroscience, now come to the stage where we can record for many, many neurons at the same time. We can now measure thousands of neurons real time, one by one. And now we can finally start to understand and to measure the inflammation, information flows in our brain. So we can start comparing neurons to chips. Why is it that neurons are so much more energy efficient than computer chips? Is it because of these action potentials? We can also start looking at the networks. So the networks that, for instance, your insurance company uses to determine whether you are going to crash your car or not. These are called deep neural networks. And in these networks, connections are only in one direction. They're called feed-forward networks. They only go forward. Whereas in the brain, the connections are more like my hair. They go in all directions and they're all loopy and tangly and knotty. Is that why our brain is so flexible? And finally, we can stu start looking at the algorithms. Where is the information flowing? What information does our brain keep? What does information does our brain throw out? So, the brain is an incredibly complex organ that, is, that still outperforms any computer that we have in terms of learning, in terms of energy efficiency, and in terms of flexibility. And we can now, with the measurements we can do now, we can finally start to understand it. And we have to study it at the level of neurons, and at the level of networks, and at the level of algorithms. So our brain is not a computer. But the only way we can hope to understand it is by approaching it as a computer, and by using the concepts of computer science. Thank you.